Hello everyone and welcome back to Dannyology episode 8, The Water, The Wind, and The Creation. When we talk about the creation, everyone is so focused on, is it is it literal or is it figurative? How old is the earth? If the earth is this old, how does the world operate? If the earth is older than that, then what does that say about the scripture? And those are completely uh, valid questions. Today we're going to be talking about the creation, but we're not really worried about uh, those questions today. Instead, we're worried about the very first two verses. The first two verses say, When God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, with darkness over the surface of the deep, and a wind from God sweeping over the water, God said, Let there be light. And there was light. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Uh, as read in the Tanakh, and translated by the Jewish Publication Society. When God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, with darkness over the surface of deep, and a wind from God sweeping over the water. In the New American Standard Version, the text says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving or was brooding over the surface of the waters. If you notice, the difference between those two translations is spirit and wind. From a New Testament uh, Christian perspective, we often translate these words such as wind, as spirit in the Old Testament, when we see the creative work of God. Uh, the reason being is because we look at, the, at God from a Trinitarian perspective. We being many are one body, and God being three exists as one, united in the same spirit and in the same mind and the same intent, as Philippians chapter 2 says. And so when we read the plural pronouns in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our own image, it is only natural for us then uh, to interpret words such as ruah, spirit, or wind as spirit, and take that preferred uh, translation. What I'm going to be doing is, is taking this principle and moving through other sections of the scripture to talk about the, uh, the connection between wind and and water in acts of a new creation. But the wind that I'm talking about is not the wind that blows, but it's the type of wind that is sent from God. It is, therefore, uh, the Spirit of God, the creative force of God, the very thing that God uses to bring about this new creation. And so all these years ago, God forms the earth. He takes what was formless and void and dark, and he turned it into something full of life. The first three days, the creation of the light and the night, the creation of the expanse between the waters, and then finally the creation of the earth is filled up by what's made on day four, five, and six. The fourth day, filling uh, basically giving something for the light and the darkness, that is the sun, moon, and stars, the fifth day giving something for the space between the heavens and the waters themselves, and that is, of course, the fish and the birds, and then finally uh, something to inhabit the land, the creeping things and the beasts and the man. And all of this, he says, is good. But that what started all of this was the spirit moving over the face of the deep. Spirit working with water to bring about a new creation. This creation, though it was good, and though it uh, maintained its goodness, housed uh, what we know as human beings. And human beings, as all of us are very aware, get themselves into trouble. And so very quickly into the creation story, into the book of Genesis, uh, we have this event in Genesis 6 and following, uh, this event called the Flood. It's an event in which there is a chaos, uh, an event in which things are formless and void. There, all you have is the water in the sky and then the water once more. 
And what Genesis chapter 8 begins is not just uh, the removing of these waters, but the beginning of another creation, another order of things. One creation in Genesis 1, and now we have another creation here in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, the scripture says, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Life had changed. And now a new world has emerged from the door of the ark. A new world has emerged from the waters of the flood. And what is it that brings about this new world? Water and a wind. Or you may even say, a water and the Spirit of God. That which had brought about the first creation in Genesis chapter 1 is now bringing about another creation here in Genesis chapter 8. Water and wind working together to produce life. Or you could even say, water and the Spirit working together to produce life. See, I'm not, I'm not wrong when I use the term wind to talk about how the Spirit operates, that uh, person of the Godhead. Because in Genesis 3, Jesus did quite the same thing in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The connection between water and Spirit is found in the very language of the Bible itself. And so you have this creative force being seen in Genesis 1, taking the chaos, taking what is dark and void, and producing from it light, abundance, life, and relationship. In Genesis 8 and 9, the same thing happens. You have darkness and, it's, and, uh, and chaos and death and destruction. But from it, using water and spirit, God produces more life. And the command is given again to be fruitful and multiply. And so we travel through Israel's history, and from these descendants of Noah comes a man named Abraham. And Abraham is told, through your seed, all the world will be blessed. And in, uh, through, through the course of time, Abraham's descendants found themselves in exile way back there in Genesis uh, chapter, or rather in Exodus chapter 1. And so you have, again, this situation of chaos, of death, of destruction, of sorrow, of it seems like no life is possible for Israel. And so what happens in uh, Exodus chapter 14? In Exodus 14, the children of Israel are fleeing from the Egyptians, and they are caught right? They're surrounded on every side with their backs to the sea. And in Exodus 14 and verse 13, Moses says to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you'll never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. So then what you see in the following text in verse 21 is that Moses stretches out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea, notice again, into dry land. So the waters were divided. Wow. <laughs> Do you see the connection here? between this passage and Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 8. The wind is sent 
to blow the waters back, to divide the water in Genesis chapter 1. The wind is sent in Genesis chapter 8 to blow the wind back, to divide the water. And out of this water and wind comes life. And now here in Exodus chapter 14, you have the wind being sent once more, the Spirit of God working in the water to produce in Israel a new life. As he says here, you will see your salvation. Excuse me, you will see uh, your salvation. And so then, when Moses stre- stretches his hand over the sea, the sea returns to its normal state. The waters return and cover up the horsemen. See, when the wind stops, when the spirit stops, and now it's just the water, the water settles and it's returned back to its chaos and its destruction when the winds are held back. And so in Exodus 14, what you have is yet another creation. God working with water and spirit to bring about Israel into this new mode of existence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Moses, or rather the Apostle Paul says of Moses that they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This entrance into the wilderness, this entrance into this new, to this uh, old covenant world, into this different type of creation, is brought about through God working in water and spirit to save them from the Egyptians and give them a new chance at life. This creation story, we see it taking place again, again, and again. But it didn't stop with. Moses. You see, there was more uh, creating to be done. Interestingly enough, in uh, the book of Joshua chapter 5, right, in uh, really Joshua chapter uh, 4 and 5, you have the children of Israel uh, crossing over the sea again. Um, They weren't crossing over the sea, of course, this time, but they were uh, crossing over the Jordan River to get into the Promised Land. So you almost have uh, this consummation of what was begun uh, when when they crossed over the Red Sea the first time. And so it's interesting just to see that uh, play out. However, I don't recall the term wind uh, being used within that passage. Maybe it's there, uh, but I don't remember it being there. All right, let's move on. Let's go to the book of Acts now. So in the book of Acts, chapter chapter 1, there's this promise that's made. God speaking to the people, he says in verse uh, he says in verse 5, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then he says a little bit later in verse 8, you'll receive Holy Spirit, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria even to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now look at chapter 2 of Acts, or just listen to me, read it. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a, oh, you'll never guess this, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of, as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. But Spirit here, think about it as he pictures it in verse 2, as a rushing wind. Again, we have Spirit entering into the picture here in Acts chapter 2. And if you look further into chapter uh, 2 verse 38, Peter says to the people, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the goodness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. See, the pattern is maintained here. Water and Spirit working now to bring about yet another creation. As Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, notice that in Moses, 1 Corinthians 10, they were baptized into Moses, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, not in Moses, in Christ, he is a new creation. Water and Spirit, these two pictures working together 
within now the first century church to bring about yet another type of creation. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 3 and verse 5, Truly I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. See, it because he's not a new creation. You see, this process of Spirit working in water to bring about a new creation is, uh, is evident even here in the New Testament in the creation of the New Testament church. Water and Spirit working together, working with one another in conjunction with one another to bring about this new type of person. What he calls here being born again, or you could even say being born from above. This isn't a type of birth that comes uh, from a mother, as you see in John 3 and verse 4. But this is a new type of creation. Uh, this is a this is a re rejuvenation. You know, interestingly enough, uh, in childbirth, what do you have? You have the uh, the water that's present there, but you also have a child taking the breath of life for the first time, breathing in and soaking in that oxygen. And so in a sense, you do have life and uh, water and spirit all there in one. But the command is in John 3, or the suggestion is, the, the exhortation is, you must be born again of water and of the spirit. These two things working together to bring about yet a new creation. This is the fourth creation, by the way, that we've gotten to so far. Let me show you something else, though. Kind of like the uh, the whole thing with the Egyptians in Exodus 14. We have something similar in Revelation 7. Revelation 7 says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. Why? So that no one would, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel standing, uh, ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth of the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now when they hold back the wind, what happens? Chaos, death, destruction. Voidness, darkness, nothingness, as you saw in Genesis 1, as you saw later now in uh, Exodus chapter 14, and finally here in Revelation 7. See, when the, when, the, when the wind is held back, now we go into decreation, we go into destruction. And so the angel says, wait a minute, hold on, don't hold the winds back just yet, don't harm the earth or the seas or the trees until we've, make sure, until we've ensured that the remnant is out. So again, you have this continuing theme of water and spirit. When they work together, it produces life. When they're separated, it produces death. All right. <clears throat> back to this. Uh, well, let's uh, back to this revelation. So, what is what is revelation all about? Isn't revelation all about a new creation, passing away of old heavens and earth, and and bringing in of uh, new heavens and a new earth? In fact, uh, listen to this. This is uh, from the JPS commentary on the book of Genesis. The scripture says, These mythical beings, he, uh, so what he's talking about here is, in some creation, ancient Jewish creation accounts, they had borrowed from Babylonian creation myths and had described creation as a cosmic battle between all the, the forces of deity. <clears throat> so, these mythical beings are variously... Uh, designated sea, river, leviathan, arrogant one, <coughs> excuse me, and dragon. There is no consensus in these fragments regarding the ultimate fate of these creatures. One version has them utterly destroyed by God, and another the character, the chaotic forces, personalizes monsters, are put under restraint by his power. All right, so in ancient Jewish creation stories, basically what they talked about when they gathered around the campfire at night, you have... A dragon and river and sea and uh, the the arrogant one all sort of battling it out with God being the victor. 
Now, what do we have in Revelation 7? Or not Revelation, but in the book of Revelation in general. You've got the dragon. You've got the arrogant beast. You've got the sea. You've got all these things, uh, all these different uh, entities that are sort of battling it out. And the Christ comes out on top and is victorious. And so Revelation, in more ways than one, is intertwined with these ancient creation myths. And it's all about bringing about this new creation, water and spirit working together to produce a new heavens and a new earth. Now, these aren't a different new heavens and new earth than what we read about in 2 Corinthians 5.17. But this is the new covenant, the new Jerusalem, the holy city, the bride of Christ. You know, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Titus says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by, notice, the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So you have, again, this pouring out, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, intertwined with this washing of regeneration, these symbols of spirit and water coming together to produce in them a new creation, a renewing, a new heavens and a new earth, uh, a new type of people. Furthermore, in Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians 5 and verse 26, the scripture says uh, that Jesus gave up himself for the church so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, again, notice, by the washing of water with the word. Uh, The word was one way that uh, the first century church talked about the spirit because it's the spirit that is uh, producing the word, uh, working within the word to bring about this new creation, bring about this new covenant. So again, you have the washing of water with the word, the washing of regeneration and the spirit, uh, the water and the spirit, the wind and the waves all working together to bring about a new creation, a new type of people. Isn't that just beautiful? You just see this all through Scripture. When God is doing something new, it's 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 using the Spirit of God. Now, here's what's happened. Here's what's happened. God the Father and the Holy Spirit, for some people, has turned into God God the Father. Rather, God, uh, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit has turned into God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Bible. We've removed the Spirit from this equation. Not only that, though, when you look at some places, you have the Spirit and the water, and some people have removed that creating force that exists within the water. The Spirit works within the water. Some people remove the Spirit from the equation. Some people remove the water from the equation. But Jesus says you have to have both. The Spirit working within the water. This is how it's been since the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what is found there in the beginning? The Spirit, the wind, and the water. It was present there. It was present in Genesis 9 and 8 with the flood. It was present in the creation of Israel. And it was present in the creation of the New Testament church. I think that's a pretty strong argument. For the practice of baptism. Not in a uh, dogmatic sort of way, uh, not in sort of a legalistic kind of way, uh, but in simply participating in the never ending creative process of God. A God who calls us to be creators ourselves and uh, in, in loving one another and working together to make this world a better place. Baptism is taking part in something that was that was from the very beginning and inviting the wind and the water to rejuvenate you and to bring you about as a new creature. This isn't, by the way, a, a baptismal regeneration thing. The, the, the water, there's nothing special about the water. The water itself brings destruction and chaos, but spirit working in the water is what produces the new life. See, the water part is just 
uh, the means through which the spirit works. It's it is the symbol that is there to show us what's happening in the spiritual realm. It's it's the the physical practice that demonstrates what the spirit is doing on the inside, how the spirit is changing your life uh, forever in that way. You see, and so don't think that I'm trying to to promote this very sort of strict view of of baptism. It's simply a step in the process, but it's much more than that. It is participating in the very fabric of creation itself, water and spirit. In fact, some of the ancients uh, used to believe, the ancient philosophers used to believe that, that water was the element from which everything else was made. That's a very biblical idea, almost, because it's from the water that all of these things emerge. All right, there is my talk on the creation on water and spirit. Uh, I hope that I hope that you were able to look past the baptism arguments and see uh, just how cool this theme is of water and spirit, of water and wind. I know that I am definitely not the first person to point that out because I got it from somebody else. Uh, specifically, I mean, I remember talking about this years ago, but you know, the thing that kind of pricked it in my mind recently was the JPS Torah commentary. That's what kind of got it going for the podcast. But, you know, I know this is a theme that a lot of people have talked about, but I've just seen it in a new clarity recently. If you want the baptism arguments, though, don't worry. Uh, I want to talk about baptism next Monday, if I remember to do this and if I feel like doing it. Sometimes I change my mind. And then the next Monday, I want to talk about instrumental music. That's right, instrumental music. So, that's going to be fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, you have a great day, a great week. Enjoy your Labor Day. Time to, time to take the day off. And I'm going to be spending the day uh, doing anti-rain dances to keep the hurricane from hitting us. How about that? All right. Y'all have a great day. God bless.